It's my pleasure to introduce Lieutenant General Patricia Horoho, the Army Surgeon General, who is this year's AMSIS Honorary President uh, for her remarks. Uh, General Horoho. Good morning. I just want to do a quick audio check, so if someone in the back can put their hand up if it's good. Excellent. So Admiral Karen, thank you so much for your leadership and for putting this conference together and for allowing me to serve as the honorary president for this year. I appreciate that very, very much. It's wonderful to look out in the audience and to see our international partners. Thank you for being here our sister service as well as our federal partners. These are the opportunities that allow us to come together to really share our thoughts, our experiences, and then to build relationships that we capitalize on when other issues arise around the globe. Around the globe. So thank you very, very much. If I've learned anything over the course of my career, it's that the future spectrum of success, whether it's in the area of health or health care, or whether it's to defend and protect our nation, our allies, or our core values, is that the path to success will not be accomplished through competition, isolation, nor an environment of suspicion. Success will truly come through genuine collaboration. So what I want to do this morning is start with a brief history that gives the perspective for our uniformed services and our medical personnel who will always be called upon to protect and defend this great nation. So I'm going to ask you to go back to 1976. Go back about 40 years. And I'm always nervous when we go back in time because there's probably someone sitting out in this audience that wasn't even born in 1976. But I'm going to take that risk. So in 1976, that was America's bicentennial. We celebrated 200 years as a free nation. And if you look at the photo in front of you, you'll recognize the gentleman at the podium as being President Ronald Reagan, a president that I deeply admire and one that led our nation at a pivotal time in our history. But there were other occurrences and other major events that happened in the year of 1976. For instance, it was the 21st Summer Olympic Games. And does anybody remember where those were held? Just holler out. Montreal, where more than 6,000 athletes from 92 different countries competed in games. But 1976, was also the beginning of a crisis that we face today. It's consumed the time of my colleagues that are sitting on the stage today, many of you in the audience, your peers, your families, our nation, and the world. The Ebola virus, this disease first appeared in 1976. The outbreak was in Zaire, which occurred in a village near the Ebola River. Today's Ebola virus outbreak is in Guyana, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and most recently in Mali. It's from the same Ebola virus species that was first identified in 1976. Today's Ebola virus outbreak has struck fear around the world. Much of the fear is because there is no effective vaccination, no proven treatment, and it is lethal. But that's not to say that the disease is always fatal, because there's a tremendous amount of work that is occurring to develop a vaccine. So with all of that background, many Americans are asking the question, why did the United States military, why are they serving in West Africa supporting Operation United Assistance? Why would we expose soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines to this risk? It's because this is what we do. It's what we do as a military, 
It's what we do as a healthcare organization. It's what we do as a caring, humane society. There are political, military, diplomatic, and humanitarian reasons for our involvement in combating Ebola in Western Africa. And they're all inextricably linked, more so now than ever before in our history. Politically, the areas where Ebola is occurring today are very impoverished and politically volatile reason, regions. Preventing government collapse and its ensuing chaos is in the world's best interest. We've seen what happened in areas similar circumstances in Somalia, in Bosnia, and the Middle East. There is certainly a military threat in the potential for further spread to our country, to our allies, as well as our armed forces. And if we go back in time to World War I, we had more soldiers that actually died from influenza pandemic than they did from guns or from gas. And then there's the diplomatic threat in terms of a lost opportunity. To a hungry, scared, impoverished child, the lasting impressions of others coming to their aid can never be completely erased, no matter how much propaganda that they are exposed to in the future. And then finally, there's a humanitarian aspect of our going into harm's way to fight Ebola. It strikes at the very core of why most of us chose to enter the healthcare field as a profession, helping those in dire need. But still, it's halfway around the world. So why is something that's halfway around the world a national threat? This 2012 graphic from The Lancet shows daily travel along global aviation routes. The red lines represent routes where thousands travel per day. The yellow represents hundreds, and the blue represents tens. Nowhere in the world is protected by the distance from diseases today. The President of the United States turned to the US military to help fight the Ebola outbreak along with other federal entities, agencies, international governments, and aid groups. The military has a special capability that's unique and crucial in containing the Ebola outbreak. The military has the capacity and the scalability to bring organization where others see chaos. In Liberia, the military established air and sea bridges in days rather than months or years into the affected areas and are providing logistics, engineering, construction, Ebola treatment units, and training support. These same activities are also being accomplished by our allies in other countries. And we should all be proud of the integrated federal system that responded to this global threat. And I'd like to show you a real quick video clip for Major Darrell Williams, who was the first commander into Liberia. As Ebola continues its deadly march across West Africa, the U.S. military has boots on the ground to help stop the disease in its tracks. Last week, soldiers arrived in Monrovia under the command of Major General Darrell Williams, commander of U.S. Army Africa. General Williams says it will take a team effort to resolve this crisis. The U.S. military is not here to solve Ebola. Uh, the CDC, AID, the leadership provided the government library, the U.S. Embassy here, all the folks that I mentioned, that team of teams is what's going to help stop Ebola or contribute to stopping Ebola. An around-the-clock construction operation is underway to complete the first of 17 U.S.-funded Ebola treatment units. It has a 150-bed capacity that could be ready within days. Military blood labs have also been set up to reduce the wait times for results from several days to several hours. But what is different today than from 1976? The difference is the outbreak, the response, and the threat of Ebola in 1976 was localized, isolated, and then contained. It burned itself out, or so we thought. 
today, in 2014, we live in a completely different world. The threat is neither localized, isolated, nor, as we've seen firsthand, yet contained. It's global. So just as our world has changed, so too has our response. It's international, it's integrated, and it's synchronized. You in this room and those you lead make this happen. Through interagency collaboration and a whole government approach, we've expanded our capacity, our resilience, and our effectiveness to not only the Ebola threat, but the future global crises as well. It's what we do, what we do in hospitals, what we do in theaters of war, what we do in improvised nations struggling to survive. In 1976, we operated in a world, if you want it to go fast, you went alone. If you want it to go far, you went together. We need to transition the system that can do both, that can go fast and go far. That's where better, safer, healthier future lies. I truly believe that there is no other way that a society as large as we are can have large scale progress against the wicked complex problems of our time unless we fully embrace a genuine culture of collaboration. Being here today and participating in these conversations is where it starts and where the action can actually be strengthened. So thank you all for taking the time out of your schedule to be here, and I hope that you enjoy the remainder of the conference. Thank you. Serving a heel and most honored to serve. Thanks.